Hi, I'm Phil Kelly, and today I'm going to take you through Chapter 3 of the textbook Management Theory and Practice, Edition 9. So we're going to be looking at classical management, which was mentioned in Chapter 1. So in Chapter 1, we did look at four large building blocks, I suppose, to management theory <clears throat> and how it was developed over the 20th century. And I kind of suggested for convenience, it's probably easy to think of almost quarters of the 20th century as to when these schools dominated our thinking. And certainly the school from the classical scientific management era was really the first quarter of the 20th century and was then followed by the HR school, particularly from the 1930s, and it gained dominance all the way through the 20th century, but dominance around the um, second quarter of the 20th century. And we'll be touching on HR theories, particularly motivation, group work and leadership in the following chapters of the book before looking at contingency theory and the strategic school towards the end of the 20th century. But let's focus our attention for now on theories uh, of classical management and how they emerged and developed and I am assuming that you've read uh, chapter 3 in the textbook already which is always useful before these presentations. As we look at each set of sort of theories and ideas around that period in time it's important to note that yes as time has gone by many of these theories have been criticised and it's right that these theories should be criticised and developed further and made to better fit the changing context that we often find ourselves in as managers. But I do think it's important to remind you that each of these eras of management still have an important contribution to make to contemporary management, but in some ways they'll have been remoulded to fit the more specific needs that we find ourselves in and the specific challenges that we face. So we're going to start with uh, classical scientific management, uh, that period uh, that was dominated by people like Fayol and Weber and Taylor, but lots of other people as well. So I've listed some learning outcomes. Do have a little read of these. They do indicate what you should know at the end of study in this chapter and reading more widely around classical management. I think just picking out a couple of key points in these learning outcomes. The first one is, I think it's important to get some idea in your mind of what do we mean by principles, principles of management. And in many ways, uh, a principle is kind of like a law. And when the classical management theory scholars and practitioners were thinking about how to create management knowledge and theory, they were really bounded by what was going on at the time, which was the dominance of scientific thinking and how you can come up with laws, generalizations, that can easily be transferred uh, to uh, any organization about management and how to go about it. And so they were looking for general laws, uh, and that was something that dominated the classical sort of school. What were those general principles that if we could distill them as knowledge, each and every manager, no matter what organization they were going to work in, would be able to use them. Since then, of course, there's been a lot of debate about whether you can have laws of management at all uh, and certainly if you do have any guiding principles to what extent they should be flexible and we're going to touch on that as we go through subsequent chapters and I don't want to get bogged down with that debate in this chapter for now I want us to look more closely at what they tried to identify as key sort of areas of a theory of management. The other thing I think that's worth pointing out at this stage is we are talking about the first quarter of the 20th century and at that time, you have to get into your mind what was going on, what the context was. There was much less, obviously, things like globalisation, much less internationalisation. There was much less competition. Uh, there were a lot more monopolies. There were a lot more state run companies and things were different in different countries around the world. But one thing that was perhaps common to pretty much most of them uh, was the need for efficiency, the need to use resources well, the need to be productive and all of those kind of things. And so much of the scientific management thinking, part of classical management, 
was really about gaining efficiency and productivity uh, and that was at the forefront of their minds and the debate or uh, the difference between efficiency and effectiveness is something that I'd like to draw out over this first part of the book and we certainly revisit things when we talk about effectiveness in the strategy school towards the end of the 20th century and I think as organizations became more competitive and environments became more competitive and as we got increased internationalization and globalization then the need for effectiveness grew more and more as the 20th century progressed but if we go back to the beginning of the 20th century uh, the main thing on people's minds was efficiency and productivity okay trying to understand the evolution of management theory does require you to try and think about this context i know it's over 100 years ago uh, and you probably won't know anybody who was alive then not even me um, but i think you do have to try and put it in context and i think what you have to think about is what came before um, this classical period it really was the industrial revolution uh, and what did the industrial revolution do well it kind of brought us factories and factories brought us groups of people the organization and suddenly started to increase this need for efficiency and part of this was the need for management and management responsibilities so read the vignette uh, on page 30 and 32 try and use that to position the classical era of management how it came to be and what was on the minds of some of those famous scholars that contributed to it uh, but before we do that uh, I'd like to just show you a, a short animated video just to get you thinking about the Industrial Revolution, how it drove some of the challenges for the classical era, and what were some of the outcomes of the classical era, and then we'll look at some of those things in a little bit more detail later. Classical, in the case of management theory, refers to the first significant period when management was studied and theories presented. The earliest studies of management were arguably in the first quarter of the 20th century. However, to understand what these theories were and how they came about, we will first need to explore the cottage industry and industrial revolution that came beforehand. In a classic cottage industry, a farm would sell the cotton, linen or wool to many other cottages, who would then spin it into yarn, use a loom to create fabric out of the yarn, then cut and sew the fabric into clothing. If they needed buttons etc, they could buy them from another cottage that produced buttons. Little investment was required to start up, and few people if any were employed. The Industrial Revolution which started in Great Britain marked a major turning point in history and the demise of the cottage industry. The period witnessed a number of technological innovations and the introduction of new manufacturing processes from hand production methods to machines. From a business perspective a key introduction during this period was the factory to produce goods. This was dependent upon labour for operation and the workers did not own a significant share or often any of the enterprise. They were paid daily wages. Breaking production down into stages and using machines, factories were less reliant on skilled artisans, utilising unskilled labour instead. Workers and machines were brought together in a central factory complex, specially designed to handle the machinery and flow of materials. Components were made to standard specifications.
Factories produced products on a much larger scale, enabling them to benefit from economies of scale and therefore reduce costs. 18th century factories produced cotton, silk and textiles, iron, brass, cement, glass, paper and various chemicals etc. Developments during and after the Industrial Revolution presented a number of challenges for business owners in particular. The new, larger and more complex organisations would need managing. They had to find ways to reduce costs and improve the efficiency of their business. This not only involved consideration of the use of technology and machinery, but also people, the workers. There was a need to ensure they were productive. Like the positive scientists before them, during the classical period, business owners, practicing managers and business academics or social scientists searched for principles, that's laws of management, and the best way to administer and run their organizations. Three prominent contributors to classical management theory were Henry Fayol, Frederick Taylor and Max Weber. Despite writing around the same time, each of the three men approached their understanding of management from different perspectives. Henry Fayol published his major work on management in 1916. He outlined key management activities. He stated that to manage is to forecast and plan, to organise, to command, to coordinate and to control. He also listed 14 principles of management. Fayol was arguably the first to achieve a genuine theory of management. Frederick Taylor was also one of the early practical manager theorists from a similar period. He focused on the problems of achieving greater efficiency on the shop floor. Experience both as a worker and as a manager had convinced him that few if any workers place more than the minimal effort in their daily work. Weber was an academic and sociologist, not a practicing manager. His interest in organizations was from the point of view of their authority structures. It was in his publications that the term bureaucracy was used to describe a rational form of organization. Bureaucracy is an organisational form with certain dominant characteristics such as hierarchy of authority, a system of rules and the specialisation of work. Taylorism paved the way for Fordism, the reorganisation of the entire productive process by the moving assembly line. 
Fordism is associated with the manufacture of standardised, low-cost goods in huge volumes, which could be afforded by customers as well as the workers who built them. To summarise then, classical management refers to a collection of management theories arising from the work of people like Fayol, Taylor and Weber in the first quarter of the 20th century. Such theories were driven by challenges arising from the Industrial Revolution, which brought new ways of working. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, various scholars developed and added to this body of knowledge. However, it's important to recognise that the classical school essentially pursued a set of management laws and one best way to manage. Their focus was more directed at work and efficiency rather than the worker. So in summary, I guess we could say that the Industrial Revolution gave us things like the factory and organised labour, it gave us the organisation and that really then created new challenges for us to deal with, particularly in terms of how to make the most of this organised labour, how to get productivity and efficiency gains and part of that developed the need through scientific management and the ideas from people like Taylor to separate the role of the worker from the manager and create this new management idea and role and then we had various pioneers telling us what that should involve and one of those first pioneers uh, was arguably Henry File. Now as it says at the bottom of page 33 File was arguably the first to achieve a genuine theory of management based on a number of principles that could be passed on to others. So not only did he talk about these six key activities, which I think if you read them, you realise that they're equally applicable to the organisation operating in the 21st century as that operating in the 20th century. Uh, but also we can see his definition of management, which we touched on in chapter one, being highly relevant to manage is to forecast and plan to organise, command, coordinate and control. But obviously these key activities and this definition and the principles need to be, as we've said, reinterpreted whenever we're looking at contemporary management issues. But they still do have a lot to tell us about what a theory of management could be and they contribute to that. So study the principles of management, but do bear in mind that whilst the intention at the time of classical school might have been to create these as laws that should be followed in other uh, and any organisation as a general principle, the reality is that many of these things are open into interpretation and they have different strength of meaning in different organisations. So some organisations may value creativity more than others, some may value cost and efficiency more than others, some may need to be more flexible than others, and all of those kind of debates, which as I've said we're going to touch on uh, later in part in the book when we look at chapter 8. But all of those principles still have some relevance in our discussion about what management means 
in the present day organisation. So have a little critical think about them as you progress in the chapter. Taylor also made a lot of famous contributions. Uh, I think most of his effort was really around the efficiency side of things and how we can apply scientific management and techniques to understand what goes on in the workplace and how to make sure that resources are used in the best way. And he also started to touch on some of the issues that could now be discussed in terms of employee motivation and engagement. And as we'll see, whilst he tended to focus on the task and took a fairly simplistic view of motivation through pay, uh, we'll see in the next chapter that the HR school added to this and contributed to develop our overall understanding of you know, how to get the most from people in the workplace. So it was interesting to see, you know, around that turn of the 20th century, the 1910-1920 era, when we suddenly see this massive explosion going from companies who are really just family run businesses of two or three people to suddenly having organizations with maybe 100,000 employees to suddenly have the challenges of needing to make motor cars as fast as we can. But really anything that was subject to, you know, uh, the factory and production. And so we could learn a lot from uh, the Ford Motor Company that tried to uh, embrace many of Taylor's ideas. And we can certainly see that they made massive efficiency improvements. And that led to lots of other things like luxury items being made much more available to almost everybody. And similar principles, uh, as we can see in the Ford Motor Company and the ideas from Taylor, you can see if you apply to the airline industry more recently, and their fight to do things like make an aeroplane as fast as possible. And they went from taking several months to make an aeroplane to reorganizing the whole processes and the way things were done to getting it down to just taking a week or two or even less in some cases. Uh, and so these traditional ideas and classical approaches to management still very much alive in today's organization. That said, as I've mentioned in chapter one in particular, uh, there will be a need as we progress through part one of the book to demonstrate critical thinking and evaluate these concepts to understand what their place today is in different organizations. So it is useful for you to try and evaluate scientific management, think about the ideas behind scientific management. And if you think about them now, you know what's good about them, what would you repeat and redo, and what don't you like about them that you might omit? And there have been various attacks on things like scientific management and bureaucracy. And many of those attacks sort of rose, particularly in the final quarter of the 20th century. But many of the ideas lasted half a century, at least, before even coming under attack. And now I think it's fair to say that we've kind of leveled off with this view that there are some good points to it, but they need to be balanced with other ideas of what management really means. But if you were evaluating scientific management, uh, I've listed some of the advantages there. There is always a need, whether you're a for-profit organisation, we talked about types of organisation in Chapter 2, whether you're for-profit or not-for-profit, there's always an onus and obligation on you as a manager in that kind of organisation to do things as efficiently as you can and not waste resources. Um, and that's you know key to aspects of uh, scientific management. So there can be um, advantages and uses of some of these principles no matter what type of organization we're dealing with but clearly there were disadvantages as well something that we will pick up with again in the next chapter and subsequent chapters in part one of the book as we moved uh, through the early part of the 20th century various management scholars took the scientific management principles and various other general laws and other ideas that came in that first quarter of the 20th century and continuously tried to uh, adapt them, perfect them, modify them, but still with the ultimate objective of creating these universal rules to try and fit in with science, to try and fit in with some of the things that you would do in like 
physics or biology so in physics you know we have laws of gravity everything falls to the earth and this idea of a simple rule that can be applied across all of our organizations did dominate a lot of thinking by the classical management theorists and again that is something that became criticized uh, particularly as we moved into the third quarter of the 20th century something we'll talk about in chapter eight sort of complementing the work of the practical managers of the classical period, those like Taylor and File who'd worked in industry and tried to turn their practical understanding into theoretical knowledge. There were also contributions from sociologists and lots of other people um, about ideas of management and bureaucracy is a key area of management that emerged in the classical school. And that was really about this whole idea of kind of structure and rules to the organization and the main contributor there is obviously Max Weber. Some of the key features that he talked about are listed on this slide which you will have read about in the chapter. Certainly when we start talking about organization structure later in the course or in the book uh, we'll need to think about hierarchical arrangements and then again we'll talk about how initially in perhaps the second half of the 20th century and the third quarter that dominated but certainly as we move towards the end of the 20th century hierarchical organizations tended to get flattened and there are lots of reasons behind that that we'll explore later but there's still a hierarchy to most large organizations to facilitate the coordination and control of work and other responsibilities Lots of different viewpoints on you know what does bureaucracy look like i quite like a lot of the work uh, done by derek Pugh under the aston studies uh, where they try to break it down a little bit and say you know if we go into organizations what does that mean and it's about the degrees of specialization standardization formalization the extent to which things are written down and i touched on that in organizations uh, and also in the chapter one previously and some organizations vary immensely in how much of their rules are written down as procedures and policies. In some organizations, almost nothing is written down. And in other organizations, almost everything is. Things like formalization and standardization, whilst they reflect organizational culture, they do also tend to reflect organizations that may be pursuing some kind of quality standard, which may expect some of those things. Centralization and configuration, we're going to talk about more when we look at international strategies in particular uh, and the need to you know, have central bodies of experts versus um, letting different parts of the organization have autonomy to do things how they want. And also the need for flexibility in organizations is something that developed more and more as we went through the 20th century. And that will be commented on in part two uh, of the book. So despite bureaucracy and scientific management and sometimes the terms almost being used interchangeably uh, being themes of management thinking 100 years ago, there's still key aspects of management thinking today. There's still lots of debate about the extent to which organisations are bureaucratic. And I think the best way to view bureaucracy is almost as a grayscale, almost as a continuum and organizations can find themselves in many different places along how bureaucratic they may be. Indeed, even within an organization, you can have some departments that may have, be incredibly bureaucratic, need to have that structure and almost set of rules. And you can find other parts of the organization, um, perhaps that may be valuing creativity or entrepreneurism more, that maybe try to diminish the role of rules to some extent and don't want to be constrained in that way. And ultimately this will reflect the fundamental purpose of a given department or organization. And as we'll see uh, later in part one, some organizations try to get competitive advantage through cost advantages, and they will essentially focus on efficiency improvements and productivity improvements. Other organizations may try to get advantage by differentiating themselves, by being novel and unique and innovative and in that kind of organization, uh, there'll be a greater focus on creativity uh, and being different and perhaps less on efficiency. But even 
the most creative of organizations still need to be careful about how they're using the resources. So there will still need to be a degree of efficiency in what they do, but it's how much importance relatively they place on those things that will differentiate organizations that you may go and work for or study. So we've covered quite a lot. My main messages are classical management, whilst 100 years old now, still has an important place in management theory and a high degree of relevance to the contemporary organization. But it will be important for you to critically reflect on that. And there will be other ideas that were developed about management theory throughout the 20th century that we want to use to evaluate classical management and consider its complete role today. And so I think some of this debate will have to wait until we've studied some of the other schools that contributed to our understanding of management theory. But for now, it's important for you to understand classical management as much as you can. Do that by considering the questions, rereading the chapter, and certainly looking at some of the uh, literature that's mentioned on the reference list. And I think doing wider reading uh, from that will be an important step in developing your understanding. So if you have a look on page 43, there's a handful of uh, references. I certainly think it would be useful for you to read the journal articles, certainly that by Perro and by Pew et al and uh, by Bridgman, but uh, any of the other textbooks and books that you may find for yourself about classical management will also benefit your overall understanding and ability to attain the learning outcomes associated with this and any course that you're enrolled on. A couple of questions now just to check your understanding that you've read the chapter. If not, you'll have to go back and read it again to make sure you can answer questions like this one. So have a read of the question and in your own mind select which answer you think is appropriate. And the correct answer was the scalar chain uh, answer item F. Just another one before we go. I guess I've mentioned this a few times during this presentation, but it's certainly mentioned in the book. And a big interest of Taylor was the efficiency of working methods, particularly through scientific method. OK, final summary then. This chapter and this presentation has really considered the early thoughts and important ideas on management brought about through the classical school. Classical management founded on the belief that workers um, only, have, uh, only have physical and economic needs. And we'll see how the uh, human relations school contributed to this in the next chapter. We also talked about all organisations being bureaucratic to some extent but the question is how much and that all organizations need to be efficient to some extent again the question is what are the tensions and challenges may exist in the organization that also are a focus for management hope you've enjoyed the chapter and i'll catch up with you again when we discuss chapter four next <laughs>